In this edition of Generations, the coronavirus has gripped the world and we get the lowdown on what it means for the senior community. It's been a year since Waterford Police Department launched their Cognitive Issues programme. We find out how it's going. And Judy Jenks from SeniorCentreCT.org talks about being safe and being smart during the coronavirus pandemic. Hello, I'm Brian Scott Smith and welcome to Generations, a podcast for people of your generation. It started earlier this year and has swept the world. We're talking, of course, about the coronavirus that has locked down many countries across the globe. The virus is serious and we're finding out it affects all of us, but older people and those with medical conditions do appear more susceptible to it. I caught up with Dr Vivian Friday, a Programme Director and Assistant Professor of the Department of Nursing at Goodwin University in Hartford via Skype and began by asking her, other than the health issues, what are the other concerns for the senior community? I think one of the main concerns for older adults is the degree of isolation that can occur because right now, the emphasis is on social distance. And so older adults are, because they are so much at risk for contracting the virus, um, are encouraged to be away from crowds as much as possible. And this implies that they are not maybe going to social events. They may not be going to senior citizens um, areas where they would have activities and interactions with others. Some of them are not visited by their grandchildren because of the risk of contracting the disease. And so that's a major concern, um, social isolation. Another concern is being able to access the resources that they may need. For example, going to the supermarket to get things that, items that are now becoming scarce. Well, medication is important too, because some older adults may need to go to the doctor to um, renew their prescriptions, but I think they have an option of maybe calling into the pharmacy, using some of those electronic sources to have their medications refilled. But they need to be aware of these options and these resources that are available. But certainly this can be an issue and they could actually run out of medications because they are not able to be out in the public to have these fulfilled. So Vivian, what about when it comes to keeping the pantry topped up and grocery shopping? So options for food, some of the the larger um, conglomerates like maybe Walmart or um, Stop and Shop, they have options where they can uh, call in for groceries and that they can have those delivered to their homes. And there are also options for persons to be asked to use some of the services that deliver um, goods and services to older adults. They have some options, but again, they have to be aware of these options that exist in their communities so that they can tap into some of these so that they don't run out of food because that is a big concern because many of the supermarkets are running out of essential items such as bread, frozen food because others who are able to go to the supermarkets are stocking up on some of these items. And what about staying in touch with people because of social distancing? Again, this is where technology comes in. Okay, so you you are not sitting next to me, but we are having a very good conversation. And we also have the option of seeing each other And so, especially if older adults have um, grandkids who are very technologically savvy, they can help them to connect by using some of the uh, resources that are available, such as they can Skype, they can have FaceTime, and they can even call them more often on the telephone because although they may not be able to see them, if they can hear 
someone at the other end, you know, talking, reassuring, spending time with them, that also is an opportunity to reduce some of the isolation that they may experience because they can't physically visit. If people are mobile and can get around, should they go out now and again? They can be outside doing some gardening. They can walk in their communities because they don't have to interact with individuals if they are taking a walk. And also part of this social isolation is the number of persons that you are interacting with and the distance. And so there are communities where older adults, they can be outside, they can be talking with their neighbors across the fence, um, at their gates, on the street. They, they don't have to totally isolate themselves from their community, but just bear in mind that the number of persons with whom they interact and also be mindful of the distance that they are when they are interacting with persons. But certainly take a walk in your community, walk your dog, um, chat with your neighbor next door, be outside doing some gardening, um, call up your friends on the phone and try to keep in touch so that you are still seeing and hearing other human beings. And finally, what sort of things should we be doing going forward as we all wait out the coronavirus? Moving forward, we continue to be more mindful of the basic um, things that we do every day to keep us safe. Wash our hands very often. Um, continue to get our immunization that is available to us. For example, the flu shots. You go to the doctor, eat well, exercise, and be very mindful of what is happening in our community, in our world, in our neighborhood. And so as we become mindful of these health practices, we are also positioning ourselves to be better able to deal with whatever comes our way. So I think the bottom line is just practice good health every day. It doesn't matter if we're having an outbreak of something. Every day as we practice these basic things, we are making ourselves and our community safer. Dr Vivian Friday, thanks for joining us on Generations. Thank you, Brian. And for more information about the coronavirus, visit the CDC's website at cdc.gov. It's been a year since Waterford Police Department in Waterford, Connecticut, started their Cognitive Issues Programme, and I caught up with officers Mark Bellastrassi and Gil Maffeo to get an update, and began by asking Mark to remind us what the programme is all about. Well, the idea came from the chief of police. Um, He had some interest in uh, the program, and he also felt there was a need in our community to to start a program such as this. Um, Waterford does have an aging community, and cognitive issues can be anything from dementia to Alzheimer's. And we felt that, one, it was a better way that we can serve our community, but also we could build relationships and they can get a better product that we deliver to them by exchanging information and um, better deploying our resources if they should need us. People are going to be listening to this and saying, that's absolutely great. But why is this the problem of the police department? Because, you know, I suppose we look at, you know, the world we live in and think, well, that's a social services issue. So why is the police having to get involved in this? Well, I wouldn't say they're wrong. So we have uh, senior services and Parks and Rec and Youth and Family Services that also may have a hand in this. However, at a time of crisis, it's often the police that get called. So whether it be someone who's combative or missing, wandering, um, oftentimes we'll be the first ones to respond. Um, So it's important that we are engaged with that community, um, but we're not the only agency that is engaged. Now, it's a year on since you started the Cognitive Issues Program. It has expanded. Talk us a little bit through, uh, you know, how that has expanded, where you're moving into. And obviously we can bring Gillen on this as well. So we're we're about a year in. We have uh, 10 families connected to us through the Cognitive Issues Program. We've had one success story where uh, one person wandered, and based on some of the information that we had, um, we were able to locate them quickly and get them to safety. Um, And since then, uh, we've kind of expanded. So, of course, we're going into autism, which we'll talk about in a minute. 
But uh, thanks to Officer McClellan of the Groton Town Police Department, she um, kind of adopted our program there, and then they um, are now trying to make it regional. So we had a meeting for the first time last month where uh, members from Groton, Stonington, and Waterford were there. Um, Again, not just police departments, uh, several uh, types of service agencies. And we're talking about how we can improve these programs to better serve our, our residents. We're not exchanging the information that we've gotten from our residents or they've gotten from their residents, but we are working together on ways that we can make all the programs better. I was going to say, because that's going to be one critical thing. I mean, it's very sensitive information. Mm -hmm. You know that. Um, But, of course, these are small areas. These are small towns, and it's very easy to cross over, you know, very, very quickly into, you know, from Waterford to New London to Groton. So, yeah, how how do you deal with that very difficult balancing act? So what we're doing now is, one, we're talking about the programs that we share, but when families connect with us, we're asking uh, express permission in the event your loved one is over in the town of Groton or the city, city of New London or in East Lyme, are you authorizing us to share your information with the other local police departments? And so far, everyone has, of course, said yes. Um, so uh, we hope that in a, a true emergency, not only can we share that information, help find their loved one, um, or, or bring that issue uh, to a, a calm end, um, that those agencies will be able to do the same for us. Um, it ultimately, it comes down to them and their family. We want to make sure we can do whatever it is to, to make their situation better. And um, so sharing of information, if given permission, is something we'll, we'll do in an emergency. <coughs> That's okay, Gil. I wanted to bring you in. Yeah. So, um, you know, let's talk about how this is has advanced. Uh, Mark alluded a little bit earlier in this interview to um, Alzheimer's as well. So, can you talk us through a little bit about? I believe you've been getting training, and you just, just give us a little bit of a, a heads up on that. Uh, as uh, Lieutenant Balstrasi stated, uh, it gives us a jump uh, if a person has gone missing. Uh, it gives us also the opportunity where the information that we would need and that we would take a valuable time on the radio relaying it. We already have it at the fingertips of the officers. So they can say this is the name of the individual. They can check. And in some cases, uh, I believe there's a picture already attached. Uh, different places that the person might be. But also, if we come across someone that is wandering or seems disoriented, uh, the information that we need, if the person's already been uh, their information has been given to us. All we have to do is just look through that information. And we have not only just one individual to get in touch with, but in some cases two or three other individuals uh, that can you know, step up for that person and make sure that they're safe. That That is the first and foremost, is that these individuals are safe. No, I understand that you know you and obviously the other agencies have trained with specific agencies that deal with people who have to live with things like Alzheimer's, etc. So, talk to us a little bit about the training. How intensive is it, and how have the officers taken to this type of training? Because it's just an added thing on an already difficult job. Well, you get a very limited amount of a training and exposure to this when you're in the police academy. And then you could go years before you ever come across an individual that has dementia or Alzheimer's. Uh, but having this type of, of training uh, makes the officers better prepared. Uh, it's not just finding the individuals, but dealing with the individuals. One of the things that uh, I was made aware of in our recent training was that people who have like dementia or Alzheimer's sometimes revert back to their past. So you'll say to them, where do you live? And they, they'll say they live down by the shore, and they don't live down by the shore, but that's where they grew up. So um, it, it also just teaches officers patience, and I know a lot of times people say we're not patient and we're very quick to, to react, but I think this also gives us a better understanding, and a lot of times with understanding comes uh, more compassion and comes more patience. So it's a win-win for the officers as well as the community as a whole. And how have the officers taken to it? Because like I said, you know, uh, being a police officer in these modern times is a tough job. I don't think anybody can deny that. So, you know, this is just an added thing on something that you're already, you know, just one other thing that you have to do, you have to think about. I I look at it as as a win. Personally, um, you know, to make sure that someone is safe. Uh, is going to be something that's positive. And unfortunately, we don't have a lot of positives in our line of work all the time. But to be able to reunite a family member 
with someone that's been lost uh, is something that's positive. And uh, you're right. We have a lot of stuff on our plate, but you, we have to remember the motto. It's to protect and serve. And we are, going, as Lieutenant Balistrasi stated, we are going to be that first individual that they meet up with. And we have to make sure they're safe. And by taking these trainings and, and having the resources that we now have, it just makes that protect and serve um, model that much easier for us uh, as a whole, as a, a police department. So, Mark, you know, as I said, you, Waterford Police Department were one of the first in the region to sort of like to really get involved in this, and, and it's, it's spilled out across to obviously the other towns and cities here. Um, what sorts of things were they asking you, and, and were you surprised at how quickly that spillover sort of happened? Um, so they're asking a lot about the information that we're getting. And so we got specific training from Autism Speaks New England, and we also got uh, training from the Alzheimer's Organization. And so we get a packet of information from families who connect with us, and we ran those packets by the trainers, making sure that we're asking the right questions and that we can um, relay the information correctly to those uh, officers on the road who may come in contact with them. So they're asking a lot about the packets and the information and then the process. So we have a meeting with each family. We don't simply say drop off the packet and you're all done. We meet with the family. We answer questions. We go through the benefits of the program with them. And then, you know, usually by the end of that, they feel confident that the information they give us, one, is secure, but it's going to benefit them in some way. Um, so uh, as you asked uh, Officer Maffeo about how the officers are reacting to the training, you know, training is always a plus in this line of work. Yes, some officers may like certain kinds and other officers won't. But, you know, we, we've been gearing up for these programs for a while. And I think uh, we've been doing that because um, we have several officers here who are impacted directly either with family members, children, with Alzheimer's, dementia, uh, autism. And so we know the benefits of this training because our officers are, have family members. We come in contact with it almost on a daily basis in some way. And so in general, I think the training has been taken uh, positively by the officers. Um, and as far as spilling out into other towns, um, they've been dealing with it too. We're not unique. Um, we were just maybe one who stepped out first to say we want to do it, uh, not that they weren't thinking of it or planning on it, and, and so it just kind of kind of rolled. Um, I suppose in a sort of way, this part of southeastern uh, Connecticut, I mean, it is a slightly older sort of like population. I mean, you know, we're not New Haven with sort of like lots and lots of you know, younger people. So it, I suppose there was a sense of inevitability that, you know, this really did have to happen at some point. It was just a case of when, you know, um, when you did it. And like I said, a year ago, obviously, y you stepped up and started to do this. Yeah. And again, I'll, I'll give credit to Chief Mahoney. It was uh, his idea. Um, he just tasked me with kind of doing some of the research and getting it going. Um, but I do want to say that it's not simply for uh, people who wander. So oftentimes a person can come uh, become combative. Um, certain uh, areas on the spectrum of autism, um, communication can be an issue. So this is not simply a program for those who wander away from where they live. Um, there's a lot more pieces to it. So I think now adding the autism piece uh, that we did just last week, and we have one family who's already starting to connect with us, um, we're going to be able to help a wide uh, group in our community, not just simply people who wander off. There does certainly seem to be a drive across the state, you know, from, from what I see of initiatives happening, not only so like initiatives like this at this sort of local level, but like a, an envelope system as well, which, again, just helps police officers. Because as much as, you know, you uh, can be trained in these things, you know, you're still very much like making very quick decisions in situations which are highly stressful for both parties concerned. And obviously, the more tools that you can have, clearly, that just makes that safer for everybody you know we're human beings and you know we do not know the answer to every question we have difficulties at times uh, trying to end a call because our resources may be limited and so anything that can help us prepare to end that call successfully making the family happy the person safe and keeping our bosses off our backs to be honest with you is is something that i, I don't think any police officer doesn't want to be involved with um so you know, and looking at the big picture, you'll start to see programs like this around the state and hopefully around the country. Um, certainly, we're not the first. Um, a lot of the research that I did, um, I found departments all the way across the United States, and that's where I got some of the information. I kind of made it our, out, our own, but um, it's out there, and officers are doing it, and I think it's because it helps us help them 
And as Officer Maffeo stated, it's a win-win. Why would we not do that? We have the time. We have the resources. A lot of this was done free of cost, and so uh, we took advantage of it. And when you say, obviously, you, you looked at other parts of the U.S., I mean, at the end of the day, I'm guessing that even though when you look at these things across other parts of the U.S., it isn't a case of one size fits all because you then, I'm guessing, still have to look at your own community, your own resources. You still have to tailor this thing. That's correct. So one in particular, um, uh, Waterbury, Connecticut, I think it is, they have a vulnerable citizens um, page on their website and you can submit the data and it's kind of like what we do they gather information we wanted to make sure that we didn't collect data online we wanted to actually meet with the families discuss the packet programs Um, and um, although that may work for them we felt that having a blanket template wasn't going to quite work so um, we have very specific information as officer maffeo uh, mentioned um, with alzheimer's or dementia they may refer back to an earlier time in their life So the questions on that packet a lot of times will be asking questions about their past, where in autism, um, depending on what part of the spectrum you're on, we may be asking questions more from the parent or caregiver than we are specifically about the person um, and their past and their thoughts. So each packet and each uh, program is slightly different, and that's why we're making sure it's very specific to what we're dealing with. Just want to throw a final question to you, Gil. I mean, you know, you're very much part of the team. You're clearly, you know, you're part of Waterford Police Department. Uh, a contact point for for people. What what do these people say to you when they come to, you know, have a chat a, about this? Because they must have a million questions going around in their heads. I think first and foremost, they want to know uh, who is going to get this information. Uh, we explain to them that this is an information that's just going to be given out. And I understand that people feel that um, their loved one might be vulnerable. And we, we put them at ease and we say, hey, listen, our goal is to make sure that your individuals are safe. And by giving us these tools and providing us with extra information, it doesn't allow just the one officer who speaks to uh, the individual to have that information, but it allows all of us uh, to get that information quickly. Because believe it or not, even though we're an agency of 50 officers, communication is tough. And people will tell you that, you know, an agency of five people up to 5,000 people, communication becomes uh, difficult. But we have the, the tools now where we're getting the information we need and we're able to distribute it. And the fact that we're working with other departments around southeastern Connecticut is, is a real plus because I think in the last 10 years of my career, I've noticed a lot more talking in law enforcement. And I think that as the, we continue to have, be more technologically savvy, I think we're going to see a lot more communication and hopefully it will be a reduction of crime, victimization, and it will be something positive for our communities and whole. Gil Maffeo and Mark Bellastrasi from Waterford PT, ever so many thanks for joining us on Generations. Thank you. Thank you. If you have a member of your family that has cognitive issues and have concerns for their safety, then contact your local police department to see if they have a cognitive issues program. So joining us as always is Judy Jenks from SeniorCentreCT.org. And we're having to use technology on this occasion, Judy, because of the COVID-19 situation. So how are you bearing up? We are bearing up and bearing sometimes has a lot of different meanings right now, doesn't it? It certainly does. So obviously you're well. What is your ode for this episode? I'm going to talk, of course, about the coronavirus, like all of us are doing. And so here we sit with coronavirus snuggled right up next to us on the couch. And yeah, I'm not liking it very much, you. How about we ask those germs to please leave? Tell them they've overstayed their welcome. Just flat out tell them to get out. I don't think any of us could have imagined or thought up a worldwide situation like this, but it is what it is. And we need to all be safe, be smart, and be wise. When we think of safe, we often think about being secure, protected, free from danger. In this situation, being safe is stay home, stay six feet of space between you and others, and wash your hands. We have started using my tribe, my circle, my posse as ways to refer to those closest to us. Be sure they're safe too. Contact those loved ones, friends, and neighbors. Work together to make things as good as you can. Take care of each other and stay safe. Now let's be smart. Use your time wisely. Create new routines because being together for way more hours than usual can create difficult situations. Find new ways to stay calm. Maybe find a yoga video. Learn to meditate. And you can probably find whatever you're looking for online. 
YouTube is amazing. Take a look. There is like nothing that's not there. Learn something new, maybe a craft skill, a new language. Watch silly movies. Make your own videos. Share those with those you are missing. Share online. Make others laugh. Make a list. And do the things at home you never seem to have time for. Enjoy the great weather and start spring cleanup. Get the garden ready. Clean closets, cabinets, paint a room. Reorganize. Fill out your census form. Be smart and don't hoard. For everything you have too much of, someone else needs it. Just what are some of you going to do with 100 rolls of toilet paper? Buy what you need and leave the rest for the next guy. And wash your hands. Be wise. Take care of you. If you don't, then you can't take care of those around you. Be nice to you and be nice to those around you. Develop a new schedule. Structure helps. Be thankful for those still out there taking care of us. The x-ray tech, the nurse, the doctor, the CNAs, police, EMTs, firefighters, truck drivers, everyone that's still working. And stay positive. Don't hoard. Use your time wisely. Plan parties and events for when this is all over. Look at this as more of a gift than a punishment. And wash your hands. As always, wise words, Judy, and uh, obviously lots of hand washing, as, uh, as you said. I think also the other thing that's going to be interesting at the end of this is where we're all being so like forced to use so like technology more. I think we've all got second jobs as IT people at the end of this. Yes, and we're finding new ways to do uh, a lot of things that we did face to face. Um, I'm not sure if I like it. But uh, for now, it's perfect. I think what is a good thing about it, and I agree with you, obviously, it's, it's always better to have a face-to-face -face meeting with somebody, but, you know, where we are being asked to socially distance ourselves and uh, make sure that we, you know, either don't uh, get COVID-19 ourselves or if we're asymptomatic, obviously, pass it on. I mean, it is important, especially if you are one of the more vulnerable group in, uh, in society sort of thing. So um, as, as painful as it is, uh, you know, as, as you said, through your there I mean it'd be positive and uh, you know we'll get through this all together yes we will get through this we're just not sure how how it's gonna all work out well it's lovely talking to you do stay safe and well and hopefully the next time we do the next generations uh, this will be behind us um, or you know certainly on its way out and uh, maybe we'll be able to have that face-to-face -face meeting again but in the meantime as I say do take care of yourself and thanks as always for joining us and and Brian make sure that you're safe and healthy and yes I'm going to plan on a face-to-face -face for our next recording Judy take care you too that's all from this edition of Generations. Don't forget to visit SeniorCenterCT.org to find out what's going on in your neck of the woods. And if you want to send us a topic to talk about or want to be our guest on the podcast, drop us a line by visiting the SeniorCenterCT.org website, go to the bottom of the homepage and click the How to Advertise with us link to get in touch. From myself, Brian Scott-Smith, thanks for listening. Stay safe during these testing times and we'll catch you next time.